the more pipes we consume, the more fossil fuels we're consuming. And when we use those subsidies to incentivize the production of fossil fuels, we're increasing the supply of plastic feedstocks. The oil for plastics is equal to the oil for aviation. So welcome to episode five of the Dino Talks, brought to you by the UN Development Programme and We Don't Have Time. Today, we're perhaps looking at a, a less well understood topic, which is the way fossil fuel subsidies actually get into the whole kind of plastic story <clears throat> in terms of perhaps working against recycling, reuse and the circular economy in favor of fresh virgin plastic. Plastic, of course, coming from fossil fuels. Let me ask the viewers now to download the We Don't Have Time app at www.wedonthavetime.org, where basically you can ask questions to our guests and also at the same time interact with the We Don't Have Time family, which is about 65,000 different organizations and entities, generating about 65 million in social engagement every month. This is the fifth in a 10-part series on fossil fuel subsidies. We've looked at what they are, how much they are, uh, how we could better spend this money on things that perhaps really matter to societies, to our environment and to our livelihoods, and also overcoming poverty. And we've also looked at how governments are struggling, really, to phase down fossil fuel subsidies and hopefully one day phase them out. Our broadcasts use the numbers provided by the International Monetary Fund, who uh, estimate that something like over 580 billion US dollars a year are spent by governments directly on fossil fuel subsidies, and that's to fossil fuel companies, but also to consumers lowering the price of fossil fuels. But they also factor into their calculations the so-called externalities. These are over $5 trillion of externalities. This is a damage caused to our economies, uh, to our environment, and to our people, in a sense, uh, as a result of damage fueled by fossil fueled subsidized fossil fuels. That's a bit of a mouthful. So the front face of this campaign is Frankie the Dinosaur. He took to the stage of the UN General Assembly uh, towards the end of last year uh, and warned world leaders don't choose extinction. Okay. You need a minute? Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. And let me tell you, and you'd kind of think this would be obvious, going extinct is a bad thing. And driving yourselves extinct? In 70 million years, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. At least we had an asteroid. What's your excuse? You're headed for a climate disaster, and yet every year governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Think of all the other things you could do with that money. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? Let me be real for a second. You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic, this is humanity's big chance. So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you.
We Don't Have Time loved this campaign so much that we started a counter at the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow last year, COP26, where we were counting up the amount of money that governments were spending in fossil fuel subsidies, plus the amount of damage that they were causing on our world. And that counter is still running since COP26, and you can see it on the show. Let me now turn to our special guest for his introductory remarks. He's Sasha Giglioni, who is the CEO and chief executive and member of the board of directors of the Swiss-based climate neutral green IT manufacturer, Prime Computer. Sasha is among many other roles on the board of the European Technology Chamber and the Climate Action Commission, a member of the Green Tech Alliance, an ambassador for the NGO Hope Now, a member of the We Don't Have Times advisory board, and Prime Computer is supporting this 10-part series. So Sasha, I'm going to give you the floor. Over to you. Thanks, Nick. Um, you're right. I'm really passionate about IT digitization and, and the circular economy. And you know why? Because without them, I cannot see how the world and its people can actually meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement and other challenges, including building strong, resilient economies and communities. But look, we could all move a lot faster, further together on this journey to sustainability if we would have the right policies, clear policies that actually incentivize and reward companies for doing the right thing, rather than actually rewarding those whose businesses and products are the cause of climate change and environmental degradation. And this is actually why Prime Computer chooses to support the Dynatalk and its focus on fossil fuel subsidies. Because in Glasgow, many people actually said subsidies for fossil fuels are crazy. And I agree. Rewarding those companies and keeping consumers wedded to fossil fuels actually skews the playing field against companies, trying to help governments meet their climate targets and reuse scarce natural resources. So I'm really happy about today's episode where we are focusing on the link between fossil fuel subsidies and plastics, including plastic pollution and, and fast throwaway fashion linked with the rapid growth of plastics in textiles and thus climate emissions. It is a glimpse into how fossil fuel subsidies and fossil fuels themselves make their way into so many areas of our economies and, and our daily lives, making it cheaper for companies and consumers to buy new plastic materials from oil versus base ones. Good. Thank you very much, Sasha. That was very useful indeed, and thanks for framing it. Please stay with us. I'd like to introduce our first guest, uh, Anathana Riananan. Yeah, that's her last name. The first name is Artie. I know if I, I know I've completely got that wrong, so you can clear that up for me. But she's a senior fellow, Climate and Plastics Initiative at the Ocean Conservancy, an international NGO based in Washington, D.C., in the United States of America. And Artie designs and promotes solutions that address two existential interconnected threats to the oceans and coastal communities. That's climate change and it's plastic pollution. She leads Ocean Conservancy's advocacy, influencing public and corporate policies that create incentives for plastic production, such as the fossil fuel subsidy reform, financial disclosures and corporate climate commitments. Artie, clear up how we say your last name as you now have the floor. Thanks, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's Arthi Ananthanarayanan. Right. Um, and right. I will try to give you guys a bit of an overview on the plastics and subsidies connection uh, landscape. Um, now, I work at Ocean Conservancy, where we've been working on the problem of plastic pollution for over the past 35 years. And one of the things that we've learned in that time is that we have to look beyond the ocean for solutions, because plastic pollution is not just a problem of mismanaged waste. Because as you mentioned, plastics are a product of the fossil fuel industry. And those same companies that are resisting the shift to a clean energy economy are the main producers of plastics. Now, we need to think about plastics as part of the energy system, because we use about as much oil to make plastics as we do for global aviation. And that share of oil for plastics will triple by 2050. So that means that virgin plastics, like fossil fuels, are heavily subsidized which makes them cheap and plentiful and hard to manage. So to solve the plastics pollution problem, 
We need to make less plastic, and we also need to fundamentally rethink how we use and dispose of it. But right now, alternative materials and business models just can't compete, and subsidies are at the heart of that problem. So I'll speak today from a mostly U.S. perspective, but the dynamics of subsidies are similar in countries around the world that are major fossil fuel producers and plastic producers. So as I mentioned, you know, 99% of plastics are fossil fuels. And um, in the US and many other countries, the government provides tax breaks to encourage fossil fuel production. And when we use those subsidies to incentivize the production of fossil fuels, we're increasing the supply of plastic feedstocks. And by that, I mean the chemicals that go into making the plastic itself. Now, these are byproducts of oil refining and natural gas processing. And then plastics are also very energy intensive to produce and plastic production facilities are reliant on a supply of cheap fossil fuel energy. And so together, these fossil fuel inputs make up 60 to 70% of the cost of producing plastic. So lower costs for producing fossil fuels equals lower costs for producing plastic. And in the US, we saw this play out in a major way during the shale boom over the past 10 to 15 years, which was also a plastics boom. And that shale boom didn't happen on its own. Tax subsidies from the US government boosted the profitability of projects and drove investment in new production. And this was particularly important in places like the Permian Basin and Appalachia, where there was significant production of plastic feedstocks. And by one estimate, projects in the Permian Basin got a boost of $100 billion from US taxpayers um, from fossil fuel subsidies just between 2011 and 2015. Now, who's benefiting from those subsidies? It's again, the major oil and gas producers, the same companies that are now pouring money into the petrochemical sector at a much higher rate than ever before. Um, just to give you an example of that, one study of nine major oil companies showed that they were estimated to invest about $40 billion a year between 2020 and 2025 in new plastic production. Now, the big danger from this is lock-in. Um, subsidies are putting us at risk of locking in unsustainable levels of plastic production infrastructure across the world. Um, and governments and major companies in the US, China, and the Middle East have all made these major investments in plastic. Um, and I can't overstate the importance of that government investment. Um, one recent report found that about one third of all production capacity of single use plastics was owned by governments. So that's the big picture of the energy system. And then if you look at the local level, there's a whole other layer of subsidies, both tax breaks and the incredible deal that companies are getting by not having to pay the full cost for the pollution that they're creating. Now, in the US, in Texas alone, I can give you two examples. The first is the state's Chapter 13 program, which is meant to attract businesses to the state with property tax breaks in exchange for jobs. And the state has spent over $10 billion on this program over the past 20 years. Um, and this has both mostly benefited petrochemical and oil and gas companies. And it has taken money away from schools at the cost of about $1,000 per student per year. And even though companies are receiving these tax breaks, they aren't paying their fair share of cleaning up pollution. And an example of that is the Arkema Chemicals Facility in Laporte, Texas, which makes additives for plastic. Um, and they received about $8.4 million from that program. And they only ended up creating about five good paying jobs during the time that they received those subsidies. Um, and at the same time, that facility was identified as one of the worst polluting facilities in Houston, Texas. And it caught fire during Hurricane Harvey, um, which injured first responders. It spewed toxic pollution into neighboring communities. And despite all of that, Arkema only paid $91,000 that year for safety violations. So if we want to wrap our heads around just how much of a free ride the plastics industry is getting from the life cycle, from plastic production to the end of life, it's been estimated that mismanaged plastic pollution costs governments and communities about $350 billion a year. And that's a conservative estimate. It doesn't include all of the health costs that are imposed on communities. So this is a huge waste of taxpayer dollars, um, and it's keeping us from the solutions we need. Um, 
addressing the plastic pollution crisis is going to require a radical innovation around the role of plastics in our economy. And as long as the current system of subsidies stay in place, there are no incentives for companies to make less plastic or to keep it out of the environment. So, you know, from my perspective, we need to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies that are locking in plastics infrastructure. We need to advance policies like extended producer responsibility and recycled content standards that create that accountability and the incentives for managing plastic waste. Um, we need stronger pollution control policies and protections for public health and safety. And just like we've done in the energy sector, we need to be providing these subsidies and incentives to the alternatives to plastic and the circular business models that help us use less of it. And the thing is, these conversations about plastics and fossil fuels are happening completely separate from each other. And we can't have a conversation about fighting climate change and getting off of fossil fuels unless we're also talking about getting off of plastics. Thanks, Alfie. Yeah, you, you, you reflect on something that I find absolutely amazing that on one level you've got, you know, environment ministers or others at, you know, Paris in 2015 and since then kind of like, you know, working out how to try and decarbonize the global economy. And then around the back, you've got another minister with a spreadsheet out trying to work out how to subsidize fossil fuels and increase production. I mean, it's absolutely breathtaking. Yeah. OK, so that's super. Thank you for framing that. That was great. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. This is uh, Josie Warden, and she is head of regenerative design at RSA in London in the UK. That's the Royal Society for Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. Uh, among her focuses are the rising use of plastics in fast fashion. Josie is a textile designer by training uh, and is working at the center of the interaction between environmental issues and social issues. She's also co-author with Will Grimmond, of Turning the Tide uh, on issues and recommendations for tackling fast fashion's increasing dependency on cheap plastic-based fibres. So, Josie, uh, you have the floor. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be here. I think, as you were saying just then, fashion is really obsessed with fossil fuel-based synthetic fibres, and they account for about almost 70% of all fabric production worldwide. And that kind of market share has really been expanding in the last 20 years or so. So, as we've... Um, we've seen more kind of clothing being produced, the share of that clothing that's being made up from synthetic or fossil fuel based fibres has really been growing as well. Um, so, and we've been consuming many more clothes over the last 20 years. So the more clothes we consume, the more fossil fuels we're consuming. And this kind of coupling of those things really isn't an accident. Um, it's really no exaggeration to say that we wouldn't have the kind of fashion industry we have today, one which is based on selling huge amounts of volumes at low prices, if we didn't um, if we weren't using fossil fuels in based synthetic fibres. So they're used as energy for production and transportation. They're also used in producing dyes, in producing pesticides and fertilisers for fibre crops. But they're really also used in huge and enormous quantities to make fibres themselves. So synthetics like polyester or nylon, elastane, there are many different variations. And I'm sure all of us are probably sitting here today and anyone watching will be wearing them. Um, they are really made up of fossil fuels. Um, and in, in 2015, which again is a good few years ago now, polyester production was responsible for 700 million tonnes of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent to the annual carbon emissions of Germany. So you can kind of see that this is actually a really significant f um, figure within the impact on the climate. Um, and synthetics really have this role in fashion because they make fashion and clothing cheap. They're cheap to produce. We have them in huge quantities. Um, and actually, they make clothing cheaper to produce itself. So they have qualities like stretch, which means that um, brands don't have to spend a lot of money on fitting clothing. You can produce clothing which can kind of stretch and fit different bodies. So that itself makes the clothing cheaper to produce and has been really at the kind of driving front of this fast fashion and kind of growing um, volume of clothing that we've seen over the last um, several decades, particularly. Um, they're also not tied to a particular growing region or growing cycles in the way that other fibres are, such as cotton or wool. Um, and because the industry is highly centralised, there's a really efficient way of dealing with those materials, which is quite different to having to deal with lots of small scale farmers from lots of different parts of the world. So these are the kind of driving forces that have led fashion to be so addicted to fashion um, to fossil fuel synthetics. But this hunger for synthetics is really driving many of the very well documented problems that people know about in fashion. So firstly, things like water pollution. So whenever you wash a garment, it releases microfibers. But when that's a synthetic um, fossil fuel based um, 
fibre, then it's releasing microplastics into the waterways. And we're now finding that these are everywhere, um, even into the Antarctic, um, into our soils, into all of our riverways. Um, and a recent study found that an average six kilogram wash would release about half a million fibres from polyester fabrics, um, or a little bit more than that from, from acrylic fabrics. So this is a really significant challenge that's creating pollution across our world. And we don't really know yet what the implications of that are going to be on human health, on the health of other species. But we know it's a really significant challenge because once they're out into the environment, trying to recapture those, those microplastics is almost impossible. There are other challenges around things like labour rights. So the way that um, synthetics have pushed down the price of clothing is also put a lot of pressure on labour rights and labour prices. And the industry has kind of chased this cheap labour around the world. So I think it's really important that we recognise that those two things are really connected to. It's not just about the environmental issues. It is also the issues that are affecting kind of people who are working within the supply chain. And that's similar when it comes to applying things like pesticides to, um, to crops, which are fossil fuel derived. Some of these chemicals are really problematic for human health and for the health of the, of the ecosystem. So the people that are engaged in manufacturing are also struggling uh, with health problems. Then there's the huge problem of waste. So, of course, as the more we produce clothing, the more and more we're producing, the more and more waste we're producing as well. And synthetics, um, because they have been so cheap to produce, are actually often of a much poorer quality. The fabric, um, the garments are not being designed to last for a long time. So once things become waste, they actually don't have the kind of high quality um, reuse that um, clothing has had in the past. So we're seeing kind of um, secondhand markets being awash with these uh, cheap, poorly produced um, and uh, plastic derived garments. And so there is some reuse that happens within countries, but often when it comes to countries like the UK or uh, Western markets where consumption is very high, the, the kind of the um, the secondhand market for these clothing is not is not internally in that country. It gets sent abroad. So in effect, we're exporting that plastic pollution to other parts of the world, which one suppresses local um, fabric production and textile production in those countries, but also is obviously contributing to pollution in those places. And so huge, huge amounts of plastic uh, synthetic derived clothing is being landfilled or being burned, both of which are contributing to pollution in the longer term. And then, of course, there's the impacts on climate change. So around production, uh, transport, the energy that's used in, um, in the production of these, cloth these clothing um, and fibres, but also because the use of synthetic fibres within um, textiles really helps make up the business model of the industry, similar to what we heard just now from Arthi. So crucially here, oil, gas and even coal companies are really seeing plastics and including fibres as growth areas over the next few years. And this is really problematic if we're not doing, as Arthur was just saying, in making the connection between the rise in plastic production and the rise um, and the challenges around climate change. And so the public, I think, are more and more aware of the problems with the fashion industry in general, but few people still are really making that connection between fashion and plastics. I think let alone making the connection between what they're wearing and climate change. Um, and only a third of us in the UK, for example, think that we regularly buy clothing that contains synthetic fibres. But given the kind of scale of market penetration for synthetics, we know that that cannot really be the case. So that we think there is a real gap in awareness and education for people to understand where their clothing is coming from and the impact that that has on the wider uh, on the wider systems that we're part of and I think at the moment brands are actually really aware of that lack of understanding and are exploiting it so in green messaging from branding we're seeing a lot of um, organizations kind of emphasize their use of recycled plastics for example um, so recycled um, polyesters or recycled nylon but actually what we're really seeing is really no significant big steps from brands to make those sort of systemic changes within their supply chain so you'll see sprinklings of these kind of recycled um, synthetic fibers but production for the rest of the line carries on kind of pretty much the same um, so some research that we did last year looking at four very big fast fashion brands in the UK showed that whilst they're kind of marketing and their websites talk a lot about their recycled um, fibres. In reality, only about 3% on average of their, of their clothing contained that, whereas up to 80% of their clothing contained virgin plastic. So there is, again, a real mismatch between what brands are saying they're doing and what they're doing in reality. 
I think there is a real poor awareness of understanding what recycling means when it comes to fibres and plastics. So what generally tends to happen in clothing is that if you have a recycled fibre, it's made from another product. So for example, PET plastic from plastic bottles um, being recycled into recycled polyester used in clothing. It's really rare that you get fibre to fibre recycling. So a garment being recycled to be used for another garment. And that's for a number of reasons. The innovation and the infrastructure just isn't there to do that. It's actually incredibly difficult because what we tend to do when we make clothing is blend fibres together. So you'll see cotton and polyester is really common in lots of shirts. They'll be blended together. When it comes to recycling, it's really hard to take those apart. So what's really happening, even when brands say they're using recycled plastics in their in their garments, is that they're recycling from another uh, another food uh, feed source. Um, so where you might see a kind of closed loop plastic bottle recycling, where bottles maybe are, are, are kind of looped um, within a bit of a closed loop system, if a plastic bottle then is directed into being used for clothing, all that happens is it gets one extra life and then it will be landfilled or incinerated because that plastic won't then be recouped. So there needs to, there's ultimately a huge amount of need for virgin feedstock still within that fashion system. So really like the fossil fuel producers, fashion producers and the fashion industry is really benefiting from fossil fuel subsidies, both in terms of the production side, so reducing the costs of um, fibres themselves, but also the cost of absorbing the externalities that are, caused by the, uh, um, that are caused by the impact of the clothing that's being made. And so we as a society are subsidising these costs. And I'd really echo what Arthur was saying around the kind of needs here, extending producer responsibility, really looking at how to prevent those subsidies in the first place, and then also thinking at looking at other alternatives and how can we really incentivise the reuse of the plastics that already do exist within the fashion system. Fascinating. We, we had somebody from the Orr Foundation on a, on a show last year of We Don't Have Time, and she works, she's an American, but she works in Ghana, and she just says they, they can't handle, the markets can't handle the sheer volume of fast fashion being dumped on them and they don't know what to do with it all. So most of it gets incinerated. And they actually think that lots of people are dying in America and Europe. So they call them dead white men's clothes because they can't believe that that one person could be actually kind of, you know, wearing one shirt for five minutes and then sending it to another part of the world. So they think lots of people are passing away because that's in Africa, how the clothes actually get passed on when somebody passes away. They can't believe the volume's coming. So they think there's some the Black Death or something is hitting Europe or something, you know, because all these clothes are coming. Amazing. All right, good. Let me now introduce my co-host, the very patient, Cassie Flynn. Cassie Flynn is UNDP's strategic advisor on climate change and head of the Climate Promise. And she's also an internationally recognized expert on global treaty negotiations on climate change. Uh, Cassie provides advice to countries on how to develop and fulfill their pledges under the Paris Climate Agreement. She was a senior advisor to the Prime Minister of Fiji for that wonderful UN Climate Conference in 2017. And Cassie was named the 13th most influential person on climate change in 2017 by Onalytica. I was named as the fifth millionth most influential person in football knowledge. So that, that in the same year. Anyway, no, that's a joke. Anyway, Cassie, look, can you comment on what you've just heard so far? Because uh, that was absolutely brilliant from our two guests. And also, Sasha was pretty good too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic, Nick. And I, uh, Arthi, Josie, Sasha, I, I can't, I was had my pen here and I'm just taking a million notes because what you said, I think really speaks to the fact that we are all connected and we are now at, through through all of what you have shared we're seeing this in uh some pretty pretty disturbing ways now and uh, one of the things that and i just want to comment sort of on three three things that really came out to me and one is the number of statistics that are so startling um all of you sort of rolled off i mean 99% of plastics are are uh, made of fossil fuels the oil for plastics is equal to the oil for aviation um and josie did i get this right polyester emissions are the same as germany's emissions uh, these these levels of statistics that we are seeing and and the data that we have on this is so fundamentally disturbing. Um, we are seeing this at a scale that I think is really hard for us to even imagine. And and even, you know, Nick, what you were just saying about in Ghana, people thinking, oh, so many people are dying in Europe because the volume of all the things that are being dumped is just mind blowing. Um, which which really leads me to my to my second thought here, which is it really is a systemic issue. 
when we are looking at production, consumption, uh, waste, when we're looking at supply chains, uh, how we think about this isn't just about sort of one uh, uh, sort of one perpetrator, um, but actually how fossil fuel subsidies, how we are managing uh, these systems has really led us to this point where we have all of these disturbing things that we are seeing around the world. And, and Josie, as you were saying, not just about sort of environmental, in, environmental impact, which is, which is devastating, but also this impact on jobs and this impact on labor and this impact on health. And in particular now, as we have been uh, sort of figuring the world out in the context of a COVID pandemic, what the impact of microplastics are on our overall health is, is really, really upsetting. And the third piece of this is, is something, you know, Sasha, you, you talked a lot about this too, is just the, the incentives. How do we incentivize change? How do we start breaking down all of these systems that we have set up that lead to this, this just huge amount of volume of plastics, of, of clothing that are made up of all of these plastics, that are made up of all of these fossil fuels, how do we start to actually sort of turn the tanker uh, around? And, and what does that look like? And, and you know, Arthi, you gave some really good suggestions about, about policies and about accountability and responsibility for this. Um, who's, who's paying for all of this? And right now, from what I understand from all of you, we are all paying for all of this. We are all paying for our own sort of damage to the environment and damage to uh, uh, our, our health and, and our job markets and all of that. And how we can start to pivot toward a clean production system, a, a, a clean consumerism, sort of clean uh, ways of thinking about our waste. Um, and Sasha, you, you were so inspiring and in, in telling us a little bit more about how, how you're doing that. So really appreciate all of these. Um, I, I am full of notes on all of on my <laughs> paper and I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Cassie. Well, let's all uh, have a little chat about this because, I mean, um, I, I just say one thing, it's more an observation rather than anything else, but we also know that there's a lot of innovation out there, pent up innovation to actually deal with this problem if the playing field was 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 properly balanced in terms of economics. You know, and, and I think you can see that same renewable energy, which is growing very fast now around the world. I mean, it's a miracle that's grown so fast, considering that fossil fuel uh, subsidies are so big and the subsidies for renewables is only like about 200 billion. You know, that's what we would consider a positive subsidy. Right. So, I, I mean, I, all, all is not lost. But um, so, Sasha, can you I, I think we're going to give you the first question to our two great guests. So far away, Sasha. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Josie. Uh... Great. Sorry, Artie. Um, your report on plastics actually and fast fashion proposes some kind of a tax on using virgin plastic fiber, right? So could your aims be fulfilled by governments phasing down and then out fossil fuel subsidies as well? Or should it be look at both, actually? Yeah, I think the we kind of reason we went for that space is to really provoke a set of provocation to that industry who I think are really not thinking about their responsibility on this particular issue. So we were trying to provoke the fashion industry to reflect on actually how much they're using and actually what you know what would happen if they were going to be taxed on this in a different way. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. There needs to be like different ways of ap approaching this. And I think um, bringing in uh, maybe looking at taxing and uh, extending producer responsibility for brands is essential, but also you have to tackle that kind of flow of these cheap synthetics at source. And I think that's where bringing sub, you know, reducing the subsidies are, is really important because again, as you were saying just now, it kind of creates that different playing field on which for fashion brands to interact. It means that they would need to look at different alternatives. And I think up until now, actually synthetics like fossil fuel derived synthetics have been sometimes seen in fashion as the more sustainable option because there are other problems with other fibers too it's not that they're all fine that there are problems with water with cotton uh, with land use with wool for example um, so there are other challenges but so far it's been easy for brands to say like oh actually you know using synthetics which are you know not not looking at kind of water consumption in the way that cotton is or using recycled synthetics is an easy way of doing it um, but this would really challenge the industry to think differently about where they're getting their fibers from um, and to to really change that playing field. So I think it is really, really essential that, that we look at those um, changing those subsidies too for brands to really feel the kind of the true costs that are coming through mm. from these. Um, Cassie, from these why don't you pose a question to, uh, to Artie? I think this is, you know, I think this, 
So Arthi, something that I keep thinking about what you were saying about responsibility and accountability. And I was thinking about too, how I'm hearing more and more about how fossil fuel companies are moving more into plastic now that regulations are are coming down the pike, uh, more and more uh, issues about using less oil for things like our cars and our trucks and energy. And then this complete pivot to plastic to keep up demands for fossil fuels. And I was wondering your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a huge piece of this puzzle that's happening right now. And part a lot of what's fueling this expansion and production. Um, you know, one of the pervasive myths that's out there is that plastics are actually a form of carbon sequestration. And, you know, when that oil turns into plastic, it's locked up and then it, you know, will get at the end of life um, locked up in the ground in a landfill. You know, but of course, what we know about that is that at the end of life, more and more plastics are being used in waste to energy, they're incinerated or they're open burned, which just perpetuates the problem and often has huge public health consequences as well. Um, and so I think that's actually a really important piece of um, what we're working on in terms of inc increasing the accountability for plastics is thinking about things like um, disclosures around climate risk and greenhouse gas emissions and making sure that the full impact of plastic is in included in those disclosures. Um, and I think it's a really important piece for investors who are making climate commitments to understand that they can't be committing to moving away from fossil fuels and, and addressing climate change on one hand mm -hmm. and then investing oh, in plastics that's such, on the other. Such an important point, which which makes me think, Sasha, uh, I, if I can ask you, how much plastic do you use in your products? <laughs> Good question. None. Uh, we uh, eliminated everything in all our products. Uh, the only thing where it seems like our shrink wrap is made of sugar cane. We even go one step further and pretty soon going to launch uh, uh, 3D printed product made of uh, recycled filament um, of, of PET. So actually we want to take out uh, from the ocean, we're working there with a university and actually 3D printing cases, uh, which helps solve that issue as well. Then. Okay. And your computers are made of aluminium, aren't they? So you don't really need to, there's no, the casing is traditionally aluminium that you use, which is a yeah, highly recycled product. Yeah. It's, it's a hundred percent recycled aluminium, which you use and, and uh, that's why we're currently distributing it, but we want to go one step further mm -hmm. into circular electronics and uh, yeah, using as much as long as possible and closing the loop that way. But let me ask one question, Sasha. Just I, yeah, I know you're based in Switzerland, right? So, but but doesn't this make it more expensive for you because the rest of them out there are using fossil fuels based plastics with fossil fuel subsidies? I mean, how how would you deal with that? mismatch in the rest of the market it is indeed a uh, 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 problem you would see most of that in switzerland uh, uh, everything is more expensive it seems like that um sometimes it is but we're trying to uh, mitigate that in in and doing what we can for the customers and and go the customer base with that and uh, uh we want to walk the talk and being pounding on that and not just as we heard through that talk a lot are uh, greenwashing and using just three percent uh, um, of of the plastic or recycled plastic in their in their clothing, and then contributing to their communication within. But we actually are 100% climate neutral and trying to do everything we can in order to uh, change the industry from within. Okay, cool. Let me. Uh, I just want to come back on innovation because uh, it strikes me that um, you know uh, if you look around the world, I mean, you know, in some of the developing countries now, they have people that deliver. Uh, soaps and other things in containers rather than sachets in plastic, which has become a big issue, hasn't it? Sachets around the world, little drink sachets and little soap sachets. So there are business models out there. There are business models where I understand they use drones as well to spot plastic uh, going out of landfills into river systems. Uh, mobile phone networks now give waste pickers uh, a good price for different kinds of plastics. Who wants to buy that plastic right now? There's all kinds of innovation going on. Uh, we just heard from Sasha that, you know, the shrink wrap that they use uh, when, when they send their computers out is, is made from, you know, a, a plant based material. I mean, so much innovation out there. Could this reducing the fossil fuel subsidies, even if it's just the direct ones, right, of 580 plus billion a year, couldn't this just finance a incredible revolution in our relationship with, with plastics in our society? Who wants to take that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a huge opportunity here. And, and, you know, if we look at the example of the energy sector, I think we're about 20 years behind on plastics in terms of really creating the incentives for those system level changes for the alternatives. And, you know, plastics are challenging on, se on a sector by sector uh, uh, basis. You really have to think about different types of solutions, different business models. But it's a huge opportunity for businesses that are thinking about providing products in a different way. And um, there's so much space for that innovation right now. Um, so many technologies that are coming up, um, but we, you know, the incentives are just not in place for the businesses that are creating those technologies to really um, to, to succeed. See, what in the what, way what that would you do with that money? <laughs> oh, good question. Wouldn't that be great? No, I think I think you're completely right. There is a real challenge. So in fashion, for example, you know, we've got all of this plastic fashion out there now. We've got to do something with it. So I think innovation that could be around actually how can we kind of work with re re reclaiming those materials, work with reusing them to prevent the kind of you know extraction of new materials is really important. And at the moment, there just isn't the incentive financially for a lot of people to be doing that within industry. Um, so really looking at what we do with that volume of, of plastic that's already there, I think would be a great way to look at this um, and I think really when it comes down to um, to fashion too it's, we've got to talk about overall consumption and I think innovations that can, can get people to think differently about how they're consuming fashion um, and clothing so there's a lot more conversations about kind of rental reuse sharing but also things that are kind of beyond fashion that will get, get people to be doing things more in their communities etc I think are really important so there are ways within the industry but also ways without externally that I think those um, that, that money could be used for differently that would really kind of shift the systemic I fully agree. Challenge. Sorry, I just want to. I fully agree to that. I, I, I think one big step towards the uh, 2030 goals is that we change our economy to a circle economy. And this take make waste behavior needs to 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 be loose and 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 to dis to change to a circular economy, as mentioned. Uh, currently, we are only eight percent, uh, um, eight point six percent uh, in the that is made is going back to the economy and actually the last two years it's gotten worse it flips from 9.1 percent to 8.6 percent and we need to change that as Josie said that we find uh, uh, ways solutions incentivization incentivization to actually um, reuse most of what we have because we have enough right and just getting worse in, in taking new materials and resources so I fully agree Josie. Good guys yeah Great. And if I can just add on there, I think that's such a great point that Sasha made. Um, it is so important for us to advance a circular economy in order to be able to meet our climate goals. There was a study that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation put out um, looking at sort of how far we get on our climate goals if we just address sort of um, changing over the energy system to a zero carbon energy system. And that only gets us 55% of the way there in terms of getting to zero carbon emissions. Um, and so in order to get to that other 45%, we do need to rethink the way that we are approaching consumption and production in our economy. Mm -hmm. And the IPCC says we have to uh, peak emissions in three years and halve them in uh, less than 10. So it's a bit of a challenge, but we can do it because we're human beings and we're always evergreen creative if we can only get the policies right and maybe get the fossil fuel subsidies out of our system. Okay, thank you very much indeed, everybody, for being on the show. It was absolutely super. And um, yeah, thank you to Sasha as our special guest uh, and Arthi and Yossi and also to Cassie for being the co-host. See you again sometime. Bye. We believe by rewarding climate solutions and warning all the polluters, we will make it profitable to save our planet and super expensive to destroy it. We must now zoom in on the quality and the implementation of plans, on measuring and analyzing on reporting transparency and accountability. We want to be better. And that's why we are open for climate dialogue. We want to know what you think and so that we can improve. Let's give climate love to those that have the solutions. And let's send climate warning to those that needs to change. I invested in We Don't Have Time because I actually agree, we don't have time. We're trying to reduce CO2 collectively. 
If we don't act urgently and quickly, catching up later won't work. The drive to net zero is the growth story of the 21st century. We had about $350 billion of direct subsidies and tax expenditures, tax breaks, given to fossil fuels. I have such an enormous mobilization of business, finance, civil society and science all gathered here. We have halved our own emissions between 2012 and 2017 and are now at the 70% reduction. SSAB has decided to be the first steel company in the world to offer fossil-free steel to the market in just a few years. There's lack of clarity and it just feeds, it feeds greenwashing and delays meaningful action. We just have to go quickly. We have the technology, we don't have to develop technology. We're going to create this huge wealth transfer from energy producers who represent a tiny minority of people to energy consumers who represent all people. We are in a climate emergency and we are very far from where we need to be. Get ahead of the curve or you're going to lose. I was able to attend one demonstration that uh, kicked off at uh, Kelvin, Kelvin Grove all the way to George Square. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of activists. What I feel that I can bring is uh, a young audience that maybe doesn't know what to think about climate change. What is happening here, negotiating, it's so wrong from our perspective. You don't put a price on your mother. Now, personally, I don't believe the fossil fuel industry should continue to be allowed to operate the way it's been operating for the last several decades. We want to bring a voice to all the new solutions, the new ideas, the new entrepreneurs who are out there trying to kind of make a break and create this new climate economy. They're setting a great, a great example and there's lots of other big businesses that um, should follow their example. I really want to urge everybody just to be thinking more about land use and not just electrifying vehicles to, you know, maintain the environment that got us here today. They want to ban the word burgers, sausages and steaks from being used on vegan and vegetarian products. Tell them what they do so that they will be encouraged to do more. And together with the community, our users, we share this to millions of people on social media, so this is getting noticed. Let's bring in Shetha Chakrabarty tonight, risk and behavioral scientist and president of U.S. operations for We Don't Have Time. As the name says, we don't have time. Stockholm, Moses, one of them at Laysa Ladeina al We Don't Have Time. I say Ingmar Ronsberg. Joining us for more is We Don't Have Time's Nick Nuttall. Nick, welcome to the program. And Nick, about this counter, we're speaking of numbers. This is a clock that shows you how much money has been spent on fossil fuel subsidies mm. since the beginning of the COP. We have a climate crisis and we're still subsidizing the, um, the industry, which is causing the crisis. I mean, it's completely dumb. I'm a finance guy. It makes no sense whatsoever. $2.5 trillion went into subsidies for fossil fuel. That's a definition of insanity. Still, this is a positive. It's the first COP decision that actually mentions coal power or fossil fuel subsidies. We need to communicate climate action because if only a few people or a few companies are doing climate action without communicating it to others, we will not solve the climate crisis.